Hey, welcome and thanks for joining me as we are looking this week at a special Thanksgiving study and I'm calling it the pathway of thanks living. Not just thanksgiving, but thanks living. The underpinning idea is that we as believers should live a life of thanksgiving. Uh, that each day we should be filled with gratitude uh, to Almighty God for what He's done for us through Jesus Christ in rescuing us and, and restoring to us the vocation of being His representatives upon the earth and um, giving us the victory over sin and death and looking forward to that new heaven and new earth that rescuing his creation and we get to be a part of that and living out that kingdom citizenship right here on this fallen earth and speaking Christ into this world. And so we do that with a heart of thanksgiving. We do that with a sense of gratitude each and every day. Um, there was an old song, Count Your Blessings, Name Them One by One. Count your blessings, see what God has done. And so at the end of this song, you, as you count your blessings, you will realize um, that you have a... a you should have a sense of gratitude for all that God has done. Uh, and so we're looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verses 9 through 16. Now yesterday we looked at 9 through 12. When we ended up with Jesus um, might sanctify the people through his own blood suffered outside the gate. And throughout Hebrews, you have to understand that Hebrews is written to a Jewish Christian community there's a lot of uh, Hebrew idioms that are used in, uh, in uh, this letter. Uh, and it's difficult to translate into Greek with some difficult ideas. And I think I've got the gist of it. In particulars, I, I wouldn't want to be dogmatic about. Uh, but the gist of it is that um, the, it is, these Christians were suffering precisely because they were Christians. And the temptation was to find safety and peace and um, within the synagogue community uh, so that they would not be at risk. They wouldn't be uh, reproached, as it were. Uh, and reproach means just to bear blame or disapproval. And um, so the temptation is to get out from under suffering and just be safe and at peace in the in in those comforting areas of familiarity. And so the whole letter's about, he, the whole gist of the letter is what he's going to talk about here, of going outside uh, the camp, outside the city, uh, and bearing the, pro, the reproach of Christ. Uh, that that is, that is what we are supposed to do, that suffering is not alien uh, to Christianity. It's not a glitch. It's part of being a Christian. Uh, it, it's not unusual. It is unusual not to suffer. And we as believers in the United States have had this uh, for ever so long because we were founded as a Christian nation of not being persecuted, uh, of uh, that being the dominant philosophy or idea uh, in the nation, whether people were actual believers or not, up for debate, but that was the philosophy that undergirded um, civic discourse and our culture. That, of course, has changed. And we live in an age where uh, genuine uh, Bible-believing Christians, conservative Christians, are uh, increasingly under the wrath, the disapproval of the society at large, uh, certainly within our culture. And as I've said before, and we'll say again, uh, unless we see a genuine... Um, a movement of the Holy Spirit in this nation, or indeed in the West uh, in general, uh, then that persecution or that disapproval is going to increase. Will it increase to the level of violence? I don't know. Um, it will certainly increase to the level of discomfiture, uh, where uh, the jobs could be lost, it could be, uh, you, you might not be hired, uh, you might not be allowed, uh, accepted into various groups, you might not be accepted into uh, certain universities, uh, those kind of things. So um, I can certainly see the risk of that even today and for our young people growing up, those who are teenagers or in high school, middle school, unless we see a drastic movement of the Holy Spirit to revive the churches of this nation, which leads to increased evangelism 
uh, and success in evangelism. Oh my God. In those times of revival, you see uh, the church becoming alive, and it, it overflows with gratitude to God, but it overflows in activity as well in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, heralding that news. As, as a newspaper person used to herald the, the headlines and so forth, we're to herald this, uh, this life-changing, indeed history-changing, earth-altering news, this good news of Jesus Christ, who he is, that sin and death is defeated in him and that there is hope in him. So that's, you know, that's, that's the basis is this risk of, and, and the calling to us is to go outside of our comfort areas. Um, I, I think for us today, comfort areas would be, ah, well, let's, you know, I'm comfortable in the sanctuary setting, worship on Sunday or in small groups on Sunday morning or even a youth group or something like that. I'm comfortable in that. Um, but to go outside of that in our communities and to risk um, being shunned, being ridiculed, being uh, uh, isolated or ostracized, those kind of things, it, we're called to go outside of that comfort. We're called to leave the safety and comfort uh, of, of our immediate circumstances and to go out to Christ, bearing his reproach. That's what we're called to do. So that's what we're looking at in verse 13 and 14. He says, Hence let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we're seeking the city which is to come. All right, since Jesus suffered... Uh, the reproach, blame or disapproval, uh, we should go out to him and bear that same reproach. We should be uh, unashamed to bear that reproach. In fact, uh, we should embrace it, according to the author of Hebrews. We should, uh, if we embrace Christ, we embrace that reproach. If we embrace the crucified Messiah, we embrace that blame and that um, that disapproval that comes with uh with embracing Christ. And so I think, I think that's something that we as Christians in the United States, that's uh, something that uh, is foreign to us, that idea of suffering for the cause of Christ, the idea of, of risking isolation, ridicule, blame, uh, sacrifice, loss, because we are Christians, because we've embraced Christ. I think that's something that is shocking to most of us, uh, that Oh my goodness, I'm suffering for my... I've been made fun of. I've been ridiculed. I mean, it, not to the degree of shedding blood, certainly like the Hebrews, and they, hadn't, um, they hadn't had to shed any blood over it. Jesus shed his blood for us. He bore our blame for us. He bore the disapproval of, of everyone, uh, the, the legitimate legal authorities, the religious authorities, and uh, everyone in between. And so we're called that since that is the place that our righteousness comes from, that is the place that sin is dealt with, that is the place where the sacrifice is made and uh, Christ through his own, the flesh of his own uh, body uh, enters into the Holy of Holies and his blood is there once and for all. Uh, so we're cleansed from sin once and for all. That is done thing. We're to go outside to him. Since he, since he suffered that outside, we are to go outside to him. Leave that comfort. Leave that security. For those people, it was the synagogue community. Leave that. Don't fear embracing the cross. Don't fear embracing the crucified Messiah. Don't fear... Uh, uh, bearing his reproach. And here's the reason we're not to fear that. Here's the reason we can go out with confidence. That is um, because this present reality is not permanent, which is what, it, what he says in verse 14. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. Of course, he's talking about the new Jerusalem. He's talking about the new heaven, the new earth, the new creation. Not heaven itself, but the new creation, the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem coming down in the new earth, and you have this heaven space, God space connected uh, with earthly space once again, or human space once again, and we traverse back and forth between those. We have this new universe, this new cosmos that we participate in and bear his image into that as we were created to do. And it boggles the mind to think about. I mean, you could spend uh, years just pondering what that new creation could look like, what it would be like uh, to have creation without sin, without degradation for us, without uh, without corruption. Uh, to, our own sales without corruption. How, how marvelous would that be? And so we're looking for and anticipating the arrival of a new country, a new city. 
there's several biblical passages that I want to read to you that have to do with that. And so we can go out, we, as, we, as we bear the reproach of Christ, as we live for him, unashamedly accepting the reproach of the crucified, and as our lives take on that cruciform shape, um, that weird me, I like that idea of being cross-eyed. Our, our vision is uh, through the lens of the cross. Our living is through the lens of the cross, that we are to bear that reproach. And uh, in, I think in, in some sense, there is uh, bearing the blame uh, and bearing the disapproval of society in order uh, to continue being the body of Christ, and that is speaking that good news, heralding that good news of the age to come, heralding the forgiveness of sin in this present age in which we live, heralding uh, the advent of genuine peace, the advent of, of genuine life uh, in Christ Jesus. But let me read these scriptures, and then I want to finish on one of my favorite movies and one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Hebrews 11, 13, 14, uh, uh, and 15, and, oh wait, is that right? Oh yeah, Hebrews 11. That's getting into the roll call of the faithful. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, a better place. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Of course, that is re re referencing the new creation, the new heaven, the new earth, the, the new Jerusalem coming down um, that, is, that is upon the earth. Uh, in Revelation 21, 2, And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Uh, Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Uh, new heavens and new earth, new Jerusalem, those are all tied together. Together, 2 Peter 3.13, But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That new heaven and new earth with the new city that is there where uh, righteousness, where that which is right with God, that which is not out of, uh, out of shape, not distorted, but is in right order, uh, which is what righteousness means, to be in the proper alignment, the proper order, uh, to be right. Uh, the, that's what that place is all about. And sin is dealt with, and death is dealt with, and all of this we eagerly anticipate. So we can bear that reproach in this world that is disappearing, in this temporal reality that is going to cease, and a new one is going to, to replace it. Um, with, a, with, with Christ as king uh, over this new creation, and we get to be a part of that, and how awesome is that? So yes, we can bear that reproach. We need not fear going outside the, the comfort area, our comfort zone for us, uh, and bearing that reproach to go outside the walls of the church, bear the reproach of the cross, bear the reproach of Christ, um, the, the disapproval, the blame, do so, and do so with honor, do so with integrity, do so... Uh, rejoicing that we've been found faithful uh, to bear that reproach, his reproach. Um, and it, it, the reality is, if we've embraced Christ, we've embraced that, that, that disapproval and blame, that reproach as well, uh, the crucified Messiah. Uh, but we know that the crucified Messiah is the resurrected Messiah. Uh, he is the coming king of this new creation, new heaven, new earth. Uh, the new Jerusalem coming down where righteousness is lived out. So we have that. We can do that. We can we have that. And that, that in itself gives us confidence, gives us assurance. Because we know, as we learn from Paul in Colossians, our life is hidden with Christ uh, in heaven, in God. He, it is secure. We, we're not going to lose it. This physical body, this, this world is going to fade away. It's going to go away. Uh, and a new a new heaven, a new earth, a new cosmos is going to take its place, prepared by God uh, and created by God for us. Now, those are the Bible verses, it, it, the assurance of those things. I, I want to, my, one of my favorite movies is uh, J.R.R. Uh, Tolkien's uh, The Lord of the Rings as it was made into a movie. I love the books, and that trilogy is was done really, really well, uh, I thought. Uh, but there's a scene in there, the, 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 
the bad guys are coming against the fort. Pippin and, and Gandalf are sitting there, and Pippin has this idea that his life is going to end, and this is going to be the end of it all. And so he says to Gandalf, I didn't think it would end this way. And Gandalf looks at him with this quizzical look, and he says, end? No, the journey doesn't end here. Death is just another path, one that we all must take. The gray rain curtain of this world rolls back and all turns to silver glass, and then you see it. And Pippin says, what? Gandalf, see what? White shores and beyond a far green country under a swift sunrise. And then Pippin thinks on that and he says, well, that isn't so bad. And Gandalf smiles at him and says, no, no, it isn't. Um, we have something better than that. That's Tolkien's way of trying to express the reality of the new heavens and the new earth and that whatever we face in this life, uh, certainly bearing the reproach of our, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that disapproval and blame from the world, um, that as we do that, we can do so uh, living out a, a, a heart of thanksgiving, thanks living. Uh, for Christ. And so that when we face that, we know that we have something better that is coming. Uh, we have the foretaste of it now. And so we don't need to be afraid. We can leave our comfort and go outside the city to Christ and embrace uh, the reproach, his reproach, uh, the reproach that he bore for us. And we can embrace that and bear that as well and do so with um, confidence, with integrity, and with honor. Uh, as we do so, we will know that God's love is present with us. And I pray that you know that. I pray you know the love of God. We're going to tie this all together tomorrow, uh, what it means to live a life of thanks living. Uh, and so I pray that uh, you know Christ as Lord and Savior. I pray that you know that God loves you because he loves you so much. He gave his son, you might have forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and joy indescribable right here and right now. I pray that that's yours, my friend, because if it is, then you know that the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, wants to give you his, uh, his own. He wants to give you the peace of God. And that is the assurance that God is working all things out, nothing missing, nothing absent, uh, everything's taken care of. Uh, and he will give that to you. And I pray that that peace is yours. I pray that God's peace rests upon you, your home, your family, your friends, your loved ones, always. Until we meet again tomorrow, shalom, my friend.